We're continuing our series entitled, Sir, We Wish to See Jesus. This series is seeking to see Jesus from the eyes of the Apostle John, called the Beloved Disciple. He had a particularly intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus, and in his gospel, we see Jesus as we see him in no other gospel, in no other place in Scripture. The Gospel of John stresses the divinity of Jesus more than Matthew, Mark, or Luke do. Now, we looked in, we're looking in chapter 1, and I gave you an outline of chapter 1 last week. Let me just review that for you briefly. Basically, it first part of the chapter deals with, Behold, Jesus, the Word of God, who is God. And we saw that last week in verses 1 through 13. Today we're looking at the second section, Behold, Jesus, the Son of God, who became man. And next week, Behold, Jesus, the Lamb of God. And I won't be next week, let me say, I'll be doing a Father's Day message next week, the week after next. And then the week after that, Lord willing, <clears throat> behold Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the King of Israel. Now, last week we saw Jesus as the Word of God who is God. And we saw that He has eternal existence. That He had eternal relationship with the Father. And that Jesus, the Word, <clears throat> is God. And John gave us three proofs that Jesus is God. But Jesus created all things, He is the source of eternal life, and He was victorious light. And today, we will see, behold, Jesus, the Son of God who became man. In respect for the Word of God, let me ask you to stand as I read verses 14 through 18. The Word became flesh. And dwelt among us. And we saw his glory. The glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Full of grace and truth. John testified about him crying out saying. This was he of whom I said. He who comes after me has a higher rank than I. For he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has explained Him. You may be seated. We're going to see three things today about the truth that God became man. It's called the Incarnation by theologians. The essence, first of all, and then we will see the two witnesses to the Incarnation, and then we shall see the impact of the Incarnation, all in these four verses. First, the essence of the Incarnation. Jesus, the Son of God, who became man. And the Word became flesh. The Word, Jesus, as we saw last week, the Son of God became flesh. Now what John means by flesh is humanity. He took on humanity. He took on humanness. He took on a human nature with all of its frailty, and weaknesses. When the Holy Spirit caused the conception of Jesus in the Virgin Mary, He imparted to Jesus in the womb of Mary the human nature. The Son of, Son of God became a human being. Now Jesus had a human nature just like ours, yet without sin. His human nature consisted of body and soul. That's why he became hungry. That's why he became tired and would need to sleep. Jesus experienced sadness. 
He experienced joy. He experienced pain. Jesus, the God-man, since He had a human nature, He laughed. He cried. He was a man as we are yet without sin. Now don't make the mistake of thinking He was half God and half man. He was fully God and fully man. His fully man can be seen in the way those who knew him best, his family, and those who observed him as he grew up in Nazareth, saw him. Now, you've seen movies as I have seen movies on Jesus. And I always come away frustrated, and I always come away a little upset because of the way they portray Jesus. I never think they capture his humanness enough. There's one in particular I remember where Jesus just almost walked around in a stupor most of the time. I mean, he was just kind of like he was in another world. And then he would all of a sudden give some saying, you know, and then he would kind of withdraw. No, he was all man, fully man. So much so that his brothers who grew up with him didn't believe he was the Messiah at first. They rejected him as a Messiah at first. You remember? They thought he had lost his mind. Now that tells me that growing up with Jesus, he was just a normal kid. He was not abnormal. He didn't sit around and read the scriptures all day. He went out and played. If they had soccer, he would have played soccer. If, you know, I think, well, he, maybe he played Jews and Romans. You know, like cowboys and Indians. Like cops and robbers, right? He played Jews and Romans. All right? He played. He was a guy. He was a kid. He had a human nature. Just like we have. Even the people in his own town. You remember when he went to Nazareth and, and read from Isaiah about being the prophet. They said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? The carpenter's son? They had known him growing up. He was not walking around in some ethereal stupor thinking, oh man, look at that guy. It's something about him. He has this glow about him. He has this halo around his head like some pictures represent. No, he was any ordinary kid. No, he was kind. He was nice. He was respectful. But hey, he was an ordinary kid because he had a human nature just like we have. Look at what Luke says about him in Luke chapter 2. He says, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. That's Luke 2, 52. You see, Jesus grew in wisdom. What did that mean? That mean he had a human mind that had to learn. Jesus had to learn to walk. Jesus had to learn to talk. He didn't come in this world talking. He had a human mind that had to grow and learn and be educated. He had to learn the Scriptures. He had to study them. He had to learn how to read. He had a personality as a human, a a character that had to be developed. His parents had to discipline him. They had to train him. They had to teach him manners. He had to learn those things. He was totally human. And now we tend to minimize the humanity of Jesus to the extent that we almost make him a superhuman. But though he was fully human, had a human mind, had a human soul, he also was completely, totally God. He was fully God. He remained God, though he became man. 
That means not only did he have a human nature, but he had a divine nature. Not only did he have a human mind, but he had a divine mind. He had a human nature, he had a, a divine nature, and these two natures occurred in one person. The theologians of old spoke, spoke of two natures that are indivisible, and yet their characteristics of each are preserved. They didn't blend over. They were each indivisible, but not confused. Each retained its own properties. While he had a human mind that had to learn, at the same time he had a divine mind that was omniscient, that knew everything. Though he had a human body that was limited in what it could do, at the same time he was omnipotent. He had a human divine will that was sovereign at the same time that he had a human will. You can see it probably one of the best ways is you remember the story when Jesus was asleep in the boat on the sea of Galilee? You remember that? Well, why was he asleep? Because he's tired. That's his human nature coming out. He was tired. He needed to rest. And yet when the storm was raging... His disciples' plea woke him up, and what did he do? Be still. Calm. His divine nature came through and calmed the sea. So here you have the beautiful display of his divine nature and his human nature, indivisible, not confused, in one person. The Son of God became man and pitched His tent among us, John says. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word dwelt means to pitch a tent. And it says, we beheld and saw His glory. Now when John uses the word dwelt or pitched a tent, and the word glory, he is referring us back to the Old Testament tabernacle. You remember the Old Testament tabernacle? When God formed the people of Israel into a nation, after they came out of the Exodus, God said, Moses, I want you to build this structure known as a tabernacle. It was a tent. And this word can be translated, and the word became flesh and tabernacled among us. The tabernacle from the outside looked like any other tent. You could not tell the difference from the outside. It was covered just like the other tents were covered with skins. But on the, not yet, but on the inside, not yet, Linda, but on the inside, it was glorious. There was the glory of God in the Holy of Holies, in the holy place. You remember in the Holy of Holies, the glory of God was the only light in there. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. And that's where it said God resided with His people between the cherubim, the angels on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. God said to Israel, I will reside with you in the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies. Remember that? And then when, and when it was completed... The glory of God so descended on that tabernacle that Moses and the priest had to leave. They couldn't stand it. It was called the Shekinah glory cloud. And then later when Solomon built the temple, it took the place of the tabernacle. And the same thing happened when the temple was completed. The glory of God so descended on it that the priest and all, everyone had to leave. And the Shekinah glory cloud, God was saying, I will dwell with my people in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And that's where God dwelt with His people in the Old Testament. But now John is telling us something very remarkable and striking. He is saying, and the Word, the Son of God took on humanity and God tabernacled with us. God pitched His tent with us in the person of Jesus Christ. 
God is no longer in the Holy of Holies in the temple, John is saying. He was among us in the person of Jesus Christ. God pitched His tent and walked among us. John, Jesus, the unique Son of God, uniquely revealed God's glory. And look at what John says. The glory as of the only begotten from the Father. Now that word only begotten has confused many people through the years. It may have confused you because it makes you think that Jesus was born. Because we kind of use the term begotten like that. But the word means one and only. It means unique. In the Old Testament, it was used to speak of, of Isaac as the unique son of Abraham. What was unique about him? He was Abraham's only son through Sarah. So he was the unique only son. Jesus is the unique one of a kind son of God because he is God. And as the God man, he revealed God's glory as no one else could. Now, you and I who are Christians are sons and daughters of God. But we're not like Jesus. He is uniquely, He is one of a kind because He is the second person of the Trinity. He is uniquely God's Son full of grace and truth. Therefore, He can reveal the glory of God as no one else can. You and I can't reveal the glory of God like Jesus could. Because He is God. Now John is thinking about the time he spent with Jesus as one of his disciples as he looked closely. And that word we saw, that means to look and observe closely, to contemplate. And he saw the glory of God, full of grace and truth. Now what, what do you think he's thinking about when he says, and we saw the glory of God? Of God. Most people, I think, would say, well, how about the transfiguration? Right? When the glory of God so shone through the flesh of Jesus that He shone like the sun in midday, brighter than, than imaginable, even His clothes were shining? Or what about when He walked on the sea? What about when He cured the blind? Well, I think those were manifestations of God's glory. But I don't think that's what John primarily has in mind. What's the context here? The incarnation. I think John is saying, we saw the glory of God in the incarnation when God took on humanity as no other place it could be seen so greatly. We saw His love. We saw His self-giving. We saw His willingness to humble Himself. Now, that's the glory of God. The primary glory of God is not that what we think of the great mighty acts, but that God would take on humanity. That He would pitch His tent among us. That He would lead the glories of heaven and come down and live on this dirt ball called earth. I hear people move and I say, well, why'd you move? They said the neighborhood went down. Other people, before they move, they want to check out the neighborhoods. My son Josh, as you know, is just taking a position in a church in Dublin, Georgia. They are renting now for several months. Why? Because they want to find out where the na good neighborhoods are before they move. We like to know where we're going to live, don't we? We want to find out where the good neighborhoods are before we move. Sometimes we move to get out of bad neighborhoods. But you know what Jesus did when He came to earth? It was like you moving into the worst slum 
in the world. Now, Linda, see this? That's in Mumbai, India. Those are houses. I don't think they got indoor plumbing. They don't. Now, you imagine you willingly leaving your house today and moving into one of these houses in Mumbai, India. No, no indoor plumbing. I don't think there's too much privacy there to you. Wouldn't have too much grass to cut, though. That might be a good thing. I hate to think what's in that water right there. I hate to think the smell that's got to permeate that whole area. What kind of love would it take for you to leave your house, move into one of those houses so you can minister to those people and share Jesus with them? Live in one of those houses with all that filth and sewage and raw sewage around. No doubt rats and roaches and snakes. You might show them the love of God. What would it take? How much would you have to humble yourself? Now, what Jesus did was far greater than that. When he left the glories of heaven and took on humanness to live among us. Now, you would at least think if, if God was going to take on humanity, he would at least be royalty, right? I mean, at least be born in a palace, not in a stable. Be born to a king, not to some peasant woman and a carpenter. Right? Wouldn't you expect at least that? But the God of glory came down and was born in a stable, in a barn, to a peasant woman. Well, at least be a handsome guy. Right? If God's going to be, man, at least, man, let him be a knockout. Well, what does Scripture say? Isaiah says, it's not, you wouldn't look at him twice. Isaiah says, there was nothing about his appearance that would attract you, that would draw you. He was plain looking, ordinary looking. You would not notice anything about him from appearance that would draw you to him at all. That's what the scripture says. That's the self given love of God. That is the humility of God. That's the glory of God. The true glory of God. That He would take on humanity. History is filled with stories about men becoming God. Your Greek mythologies. But you don't find stories of God becoming a man. That's contrary to nature, isn't it? Everybody wants to be a God, but why would a God want to take on humanity? John is given a concept that, that was totally foreign to the Jews of that day when he said the word God himself took on humanity and remained God. Behold Jesus the Son of God, who became man. And then John gives us two witnesses to the Son of God becoming man. You know, in the biblical days, it was important that you have witnesses. The Scripture says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses is a truth confirmed. And John, in his gospel, we're going to see over and over again this principle of two witnesses coming out. We have two witnesses right here. In verses 15 and 16. First, we have the witness of John the Baptist. Now, I mentioned to you last week, John the Baptist and the John that wrote this gospel are two different people. And no, John the Baptist was not the first Baptist. All right? It simply means John the Baptizer. All right. They just shortened it to Baptist. Now, John the Apostle. 
never mentions himself in this gospel by name. When he mentions himself, he uses the term beloved disciple. So when you read beloved disciple in this gospel, you know he's talking about himself. When you read the name just John, he's talking about John the Baptist. It's important to keep these straight so you understand what's going on. Here he's, first of all, in verse 15, talking about John the Baptist. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. So John the Baptist is bearing testimony, first of all, that Jesus had a pre-existent eternal nature that he existed before John the Baptist did. But John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. Jesus was John the Baptist's cousin. So he knew Jesus. Growing up, they would have known each other. He knew he was older than Jesus. And yet he says, he is higher rank than I am because he existed before me. And so John is first proclaiming Jesus' pre-existence as the eternal Son of God. And now he's saying he has superiority and a higher rank than I do. Because he existed before me. Now remember in biblical days, this idea of seniority was very important. The firstborn of the family, right? The firstborn son got twice the inheritance as the other guys got. Firstborn was very important. And so John is saying, look, Jesus existed before me, therefore he is of a higher rank, more important, more authority than me. Now why is John saying this? I think he's saying it because, see, he had a following. He had disciples. He had people who were following him because he had preached repentance for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so he's letting these people know, hey guys, I might have been first on the scene, but let me tell you, Jesus was really before me, and he is greater than me. He is more important than me. John would later say a few chapters later, I must decrease, he, Jesus, must increase. John recognized his place, his position, was not to, to be the Christ, but simply a forerunner. So he gladly says, He is higher than I. Then we have the second witness, and I think this is John himself speaking, the writer of the gospel. Verse 16. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. John is writing this 50 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. So he's looking back over the ministry of Jesus and over the 50 years of church history that's taken place since Jesus ascended into heaven. And as he looks back, he says the effects of the Son of God becoming man are that we receive grace upon grace. Of His fullness, what does he mean by that? The fullness of deity. John recognized Jesus was fully God. Paul would write in Colossians 2.9, For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. John says, From the fullness of Jesus, from the fullness of His deity, from Jesus being fully God and fully man, we Christians have received grace piled upon grace. Grace heaped upon grace. And I think John has both of the definitions of grace in mind. First, God's unmerited favor. Second, God's enabling power. I think John is saying, man, when I look back over my 50 years of, of being a Christian, and I see others in their walk with him, it is from his 
fullness because He was totally God and totally man that we have received grace piled up on grace. When the Son of God became man, He brought grace abundant to His chosen ones. All that He did, all that He said, all that He was served to pour out grace upon grace on us. Like waves from the sea. How many of you have been down to the beach and you got right to the edge where the waves were coming and you, and you sat down and let the waves just kind of hit you, right? And before you know it, another one hit you. And then another one hit you. And maybe a big one came and hit you in the face and then you knocked you down and before you knew it, another one came. They just kept coming, didn't they? That's God's grace. That's what the picture is here. Waves of God's grace just keep pouring over us. His enabling power to live the Christian life. His unmerited favor and all the blessings that He gives us. The blessing of life. The blessings of breath. The blessings of love. The blessings of family. All that's unmerited, folks. Only thing we deserve is hell. Everything this side of hell is grace. And He says because He is totally, fully God and fully man that He has heaped upon us wave after wave after wave of grace. Just soak it up, folks. Just soak it up. Just say, God, wash me in the grace. Let it soak. Let it enable me to live the Christian life. You're facing some situation. You say, I don't know how I'm going to go through this. God, let the waves of grace flow over me and enable me to live this situation in a way that brings glory to you. I don't care what you're facing. I don't care what you're going through. That grace upon grace. Grace piled upon grace. Because of Jesus will flow. Jesus, the Son of God who became man, is the fountain of all grace. You need grace? Go to Jesus. He's pouring it out. He's pouring it out. Just get under it. Get under it. Receive it. Piled high upon grace. Behold Jesus, the Son of God, who became man. And then we have the impact of the Son of God becoming man. Two things. As you think about it, what were, what were the two main impacts, the two main effects, the two main results of Jesus, the Son of God, becoming man. As you think about it, why would God come from heaven, humble Himself, live in this slum of earth as one of us? I think two reasons make sense to me. First, to accomplish our salvation. Right? What's it say in verse 17? For the law was given through Moses... But grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. Now here, John is drawing a contrast between the law given by Moses and Jesus and the grace and truth that came through Him. Now the law given through Moses, it was good. It was just. It was righteous. But it could not save anyone from the wrath of God. The law was good, but it was powerless to give anybody the strength to obey it. Couldn't do it. Paul says the law served as a tutor to help us realize our need for grace. That we couldn't be good enough to be saved. It was to reveal our sinfulness. But it was powerless to enable us to obey it. But grace and truth were realized, manifested through Jesus Christ. What truth? The truth about man's helplessness to keep the law to be saved. The truth about the only way of salvation is through Jesus. The truth about we're saved by grace through faith. He revealed to us the truth about us and the grace that 
can save us and the grace that He has done everything necessary for us to be saved. He lived the life we couldn't live. He paid the penalty we deserve to pay. So through Jesus, grace and truth about salvation, about the power of God to save, is realized, is manifested. You see, the incarnation was necessary to accomplish our salvation because, number one, Jesus, as a man, lived the life we could not live. Right? He had to be a man to live in man's place. He had to be totally man in order to live a life of perfection that we couldn't live. You see, the only way somebody can earn salvation is to be perfect. Never sin. Well, you and I have already blown that. But Jesus accomplished that. I think it can be said He earned our salvation for us. He lived that righteous life that we could not live. But what does God do when we get saved? He gives us that righteousness of Jesus. But He had to be a man to do that. In doing this, He earned the righteousness that we need to live with God for eternity. As a man, Jesus had to be punished for our sins. Since man had sinned, man needed to be punished. And so he had to be totally man so he could die for us and take our place. But in order for his sacrifice to be sufficient, to satisfy the holy wrath of God over the sins of his people, he had to be God. No man could have satisfied the holy, righteous demands of infinite God. He had to be God for His sacrifice to be sufficient. And so you see, in order for us to be saved, the Son of God had to become man. So that's the first effect the first result of the Son of God becoming man is to accomplish our salvation. Well, what's the second reason that God would take on humanity? To reveal Himself to us. I mean, if you had the job of communicating to an ant, don't you think you could do it better if you became an ant? All right? Or let's take bees. They do communicate with each other. All right? Well, you'd have to become a bee. So in order to reveal God to us, He became man. As we see in verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. God's invisible. He's spirit. No one has really seen Him. And even Moses only got glimpses. He didn't see Him, really. But the only begotten Son, excuse me, the only begotten God, the unique, one and only God, Son of God, who is in the bosom of the Father. What's he saying? He's saying, man, he's got a love relationship with the Father. They're close, right? He's in his bosom. They are close. He has explained him. He's saying no one, no one could reveal God the Father like Jesus because, first of all, he's the Son. He has his intimate close relationship to Him. And He is God. He explained. That word means to bring out of obscurity. It means to make one known. We get the word exegesis, which is a term for interpreting the Bible. To make it understandable. To make it known. John is saying to us, that Jesus is the visible expression of the invisible God. The eternal Son became man and revealed God to us. He showed us God's love. He showed us God's self-giving. He showed us God's humility as none other. Again, the natural thing is for man to become God. When you think of God, you naturally think of power. Don't you? When you think of a supreme being, you think of his might. 
or even his wrath at being offended. Animistic tribes always trying to appease the gods they think they have offended. That's our human nature to do that. When we think of God, we think of grand, supreme. But John says, Jesus came to reveal another aspect of God. An aspect you wouldn't think about naturally. His humility. His self-giving love. His willingness to suffer. You don't find that in the religions of the world. That God takes on humanity and suffers. That's what he came to explain to us. That our God, the true God of the universe, is about giving and loving and dying that we could be saved. All the other religions, man has to achieve salvation. He has to do something. Pray the right prayers. Do the right giving. Martyr himself. Kill other people of the wrong religion. All these things. Man are just trying to earn salvation. But John says Jesus came to explain to us as a different way. That it's not human achievement, but divine accomplishment. That God came in His Son Jesus to accomplish the salvation of His people. His name shall be called Jesus. For He shall save His people from their sins. Behold Jesus, the Son of God. See Him in His glory. As you see Him in His love, in His humility. Because He's fully God and fully man, we are continually receiving grace piled upon grace. He accomplished our salvation. Behold Jesus. Love Jesus. Worship Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, of your willingness to leave the glories of heaven and live in the slums of this world among us. To pitch your tent that we could see God as He could be revealed by no one else. Who else could show us the self-giving humility of Almighty God? But You, Lord Jesus, when You humbled Yourself and took on humanity and gave Yourself that we might experience eternal life. Oh, may we worship You May we obey you. May we serve you as our Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.